Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. My name is Lee Schwartz with SVA. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Critical Estate Planning Update, Get Your Plans Updated Now. And before we get started, I just want to take a second and say a few words about SVA. Our vision is to remain independent, and our goal is to continue serving the same clients we have since 1974. And that's closely held businesses, family owned businesses, nonprofits, and high net worth individuals. And our mindset is that when you're a business owner or shareholder, your business and your personal estate are intertwined. So it's important that your advisors are not just about compliance, but working collaboratively with you in a, in a consultative way. So before I introduce our presenters, let me just go over a couple of quick housekeeping items. We're gonna leave a fair chunk of time at the end for questions. So if you do have a question, open up the chat box in Zoom and submit your question to all panelists. We're not gonna answer questions as we go, but we will address as many as we can at the end. Now, if you're a client and you have questions coming out of this, we'd encourage you to reach out to your SBA contact. If you're not a client and you have questions, please reach out to me and I will make sure to connect you with a subject matter expert who can get your question answered. So some of you attended our year-end webinars before the November election, and then our webinars both before and after the Georgia Senate election. So you may have heard some of these topics discussed before, but there's more clarity now and with there's actual legislative proposals. So our presenters are excited to talk through what you should expect and how you should prepare for potential changes. So let me introduce our, our speakers. Between the two of these gentlemen, uh, they have more than 70 years of experience with estate planning, succession planning, fiduciary taxation, and trust administrative services. And they have far too many certifications to name one by one. So let me just give you their names. Uh, E.G. Shramka is a, a principal with SVA and is also the executive director and vice president of the Irwin A. and Robert D. Goodman Foundation. And I'm also excited to introduce uh, you all to Rick Koloff. Uh, Rick joined SVA in just the last few months, and he's going to be leading our trust and estate uh, compliance practice. All right, Rick, I'm going to let you take it from here. Thanks, Lee. I'm not exactly sure if we have more clarity, so to speak, but what we do have is some true proposals which we didn't have before. And the reason I say we don't have more clarity is because some of the proposals, while similar, have some dissimilarities. And just recently when President Biden gave his speech the other week, uh, provided some thought-provoking uh, changes, if you will, that uh, uh, weren't even part of, let's say, his uh, campaign when he was when he was actually running, which we thought we had known about. But now we look at what we've got, and uh, when he announced, again through his speech the other week, the American Families Plan, the significant amount of governmental spending, and, and the one way to propose that is to offset that with some types of taxes. Um, the Democratic side of the, 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 the aisle would like to refer to these as the only tax hikes on the wealthy, although we'll see today that's not necessarily the case. Um, and what came out of the President's American Family Plan of significance were some things like increasing the top marginal rate to 39.6 from the current 37%, and supposedly that's to only be applied to the $400,000 and above income limit. And I'm starting to use some of the words like supposedly because for, for the American Families Plan, all we really have is a press release and tips related to that from uh, either Treasury or from uh, the administration through whitehouse.gov. We will look at some other proposals, namely the uh, for the 99.5% Act proposed by Senator Sanders and the uh, STEP Act proposed by uh, Senator Van Hollen, um, but I want to make sure that we understand when we look at those, we have to take the overriding, the administrative proposal um, on as well. Uh, additionally, in addition to the marginal rate increase, capital gains and qualifying dividends could be taxed at 39.6%, the highest marginal rate if your income is over a million dollars. And while that seems quite high, when we think about business owners, while we may chug along as a business and we don't reach that threshold of that million dollars, what about that year 
the one year we actually are reaping our reward. We're going to sell the business and uh, we have a gain. And look, it's over a million dollars. Now, all of a sudden, we're to pay the capital gains rate at 39.6% when it's 20% now. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure where that's going to go, but that's in the proposals. And, and more appropriately, when we start thinking about estate tax planning, which is really what we want the purpose of this webinar to be, uh, understand that income tax and estate tax go together, because if it's not one, it's the other. Uh, but losing that step up in basis under President Biden's proposal uh, for those that exceed a million dollars of assets at death or $2 million if it's a married couple, um, right now we don't have a, a, a that, that tax at death. We, President uh, Biden would have uh, us be taxed uh, on those gains over and above a million dollars. Um, and again, at that 39.6% rate ostensibly. So um, we, we see that uh, items donated to charity or given to a spouse wouldn't be included in, in these transitions. But uh, I think also understand when we think about President Biden's proposal is that whether we look at any of these proposals or not, the current law as, as set up in 2017 is set to expire at the end of 25. So in 2026, we actually have a rollback of the exemption. And, and, and so all this leads us to believe as a firm at SVA that there are changes afoot. It's just a matter of knowing what they are and when they'll happen, right? So what about this 99.5% act? Well, a couple of years ago, um, Senator Sanders also proposed it. At that time, it was called the 99.8% Act. And again, what the Democratic side of the aisle is trying to do is unwind some of what was uh, provided in 2017 in terms of tax relief. There are uh, taxes that would be imposed, but there are still planning strategies that we can take away now and help clients with. And we'll get into some of these, but just so that you start to understand the tools in our arsenal, a domestic asset protection trust, uh, spousal lifetime access trust, and you'll see acronyms attached to some of these strategies and ideas. As tax professionals, we will oftentimes use the acronyms in short. So alphabet soup, if you will, special power appointment trust, a note sale transaction, a grantor retained annuity trust, grantor retained interest partnerships. Some of these strategies um, are really things that we are go-to for us as we're helping clients eliminate, reduce future estate tax, transition wealth either to the next generation or to whomever beneficiaries might be. And a lot of these strategies could be taken away from us if the current legislation uh, goes forward. So where, where are we right now? So we're at midpoint of May, coming up from June, we're really mid 2021. I think what we have to understand is what the political landscape is because that helps us understand how likely these proposed changes are. Right now, we've got a 50-50 split with the independents voting towards the Democratic caucus and, and, the, and the 50 Republicans mainly holding together. And if there were a proposal to come forward and there was a tie at the Senate, assuming assuming that as presuming, if you will, that the House passes because it has a excuse me, majority um, of, of Democratic sitting uh, congressmen, uh, Vice President Harris would be able to make the tying vote. Again, all this suits the Democratic needs and desires. Um, yet we've got that filibuster rule where in the Senate, um, it would take a 60 senator vote to outstrip or, or turn the filibuster off. That's, that's unlikely, but yet there are two exceptions to when a filibuster can be uh, taken away. Actually, you, don't, you can't even use a filibuster if one of, one of these options is uh, budget reconciliation, meaning our fiscal year end for the government is not September 30th. As we're putting together our budget for this year, as the, the congressmen and, and senators are, these proposals can be slipped in and made part of the budget reconciliation process, and then you only need a simple majority. So again, 50-50, one vote tie. Hey, this, this is not un, unseen before. In 2001, um, when President Bush was around, Dick Cheney, the uh, Republican 
uh, Vice President broke a 50-50 split to pass the 2001 Tax Act, and more recently, in 2017, um, the Republicans were able to do what they did with the tax relief uh, without any support from the Democrats at all. Now, we also have the nuance that there are some more moderate Democrats, such as uh, Senator Manchin, and, and it's, but maybe he'll be kept on board with some type of conciliation. And likewise, on the Republican side, if they're given some type of offering, maybe they'll jump ship. So we don't know, but what we can see is there is a true pathway. It's not it's not something that we can say, well, there's a true roadblock block in its place. We're not gonna see any of these changes. In fact, we, we expect them to be to change. It's just a matter of when and what exactly. Now, when we start to think about what exactly it's gonna look like, we know what the changes are, but when we start to think about, I already said the 99.5% act is very similar to the 99.8% act that was proposed two years ago, we can even look back beyond that. President Biden's Green Book, his proposed budget every year, including his last year in office in 2016, included many of these proposals. So there is a like-mindedness amongst the Democrats that are making these proposals. And if we get to that point where there's a vote, I think up until that point, our planning process is kind of cemented. We know what the changes are going to be because they're all very, fairly similar. So we've got this baseline. Where are we now? We've got uh, five million, excuse me, ten million dollar index for inflation. Or in 2021, what we have is 11.7 million dollars we can either give away or die at death with before we need to worry about a gift or estate tax. Right? If you're a married couple, you can double that because through the use of portability you can access $23.4 million of lifetime exemption. So it seems like, wow, why should I ever even have to think about this? The point of it is, we talked about the sunset that could go back to a $5 million level times two $10 million for a married couple in 2026, if, even if no legislation is passed, that sunset will happen. But if the legislation moves forward and we see something as low as say a $3.5 million exemption, now, a lot of our business owners and a lot of our um, what we would consider wealthy clients, maybe not weren't considered ultra wealthy before, they're starting to face that. Well, I do have an estate tax. And is it the 40% of my tax after exemption, or is it 45%, which is one of the proposals, or is it as high as 60%? Now, that's going to be far and few between because that's for billionaires, but that's as high as they want to take the tax. So I think, again, based on the success of the recent elections and where we are with the political landscape and where we are today with exemptions and how low they could go, as well as some of these other changes to our strategies, the opportunity is now. Um, the mantra we kind of adopted here is a use it or lose it approach. We've got this $11.7 million exemption. If it goes back to 3.5, well, we've lost that difference. So. Let's uh, listen to E.G. as he tells us a little bit about how that uh, is going to work. So thank you, Rick. So when an individual dies, you calculate the fair market value of all their assets on the date of death, including life insurance and retirement plans. You then add taxable gifts made during lifetime and subtract what goes to a surviving spouse or charity. The excess of that amount over the current exemption amount gets taxed at a flat rate of 40% today. And this tax is due within nine months of the date of death. As Rick mentioned, the current estate and gift tax exemption is $11.7 million, $23.4 million for a married couple. And the proposal is to reduce the estate tax exemption to $3.5 million or $7 million for a married couple, which is a reduction of 8.2 million or 16.4 million for a married couple. Now, currently you can use your $11.7 million exemption either during your lifetime or at death, meaning whatever you did not use during your lifetime would then be available to be used at death. 
the proposal is to limit gifts to $1 million. And if you make lifetime gifts in excess of $1 million, you would have to pay gift tax. Now, currently, if one spouse dies not having used all of his or her exemption, the surviving spouse can add the decedent's unused exemption to his or her exemption amount. This is called portability and would not change. Now, what are the ordering rules on the use of the exemption? So in order to benefit from the current $11.7 million exemption amount, you will need to gift an amount that is greater than the exemption amount that ultimately will be available. So if, for example, the exemption amount is reduced to $3.5 million, you would need to gift an amount in excess of the $3.5 million prior to the exemption being reduced. So for example, if I make a taxable gift of $2 million in 2021 and have not made any prior taxable gifts, and then the exemption is reduced to 3.5 million, if I die in 2023, my estate tax exemption would be $1.5 million. The $3.5 million exemption less the $2 million gift made in 2021. Now let's talk about uh, rates. So as I mentioned earlier, the current estate and gift tax rate is a flat 40%. This could change to a graduated rate schedule of 45% to 65%. And as you can see from the table, most individuals will be in that 45% to 50% range and you really only get to the 65% range until you're over a billion dollars. So what are the effective dates for all these potential changes? Well, the effective date for the reduction in the estate and gift tax exemptions and the change in the tax rate is for deaths or gifts made after December 31st, 2021. So now I'm gonna turn it back to Rick and he's gonna talk about valuation of gifts and available discounts to reduce the value of gifts. And just to add on, e.g., to the effective date um, comment you made, um, one of our senators' proposals, Senator Van Hollen in the STEP Act, would actually make it retroactive to January 1st of this year. And we'll talk a little bit about how, you know, if that was the drastic thing that happened, it was very unfortunate how we might plan for that. But believe it or not, there are ways. But let's talk about evaluation because under attack in uh, Senator Sanders' proposal is an attack on our valuation usage as estate planners. Oftentimes we'll, especially when you think about business interests, look at transferring a piece of a business. So for example, let's use 49%. And let's just say that the uh, value of the business, although you know we'd like to think bigger, is a million dollars. So 49% would be worth, in, between you and I, we'd think about it, we'd say $490,000. But when you put an appraisal together, it's going to consider a few things. One, it's going to consider marketability. This is a closely held business. It may not have, uh, the interests themselves may not have specific rights to distributions or to liquidating the company. So as you can see, it's not a publicly traded company. So there's a discount that's attached to that, meaning it's not necessarily worth 100% of the $490,000. In addition, it's 49%. So when everybody comes to the table to vote, the 49% person doesn't get their way ever, really. So there is a minority discount that gets tacked on to the marketability discount. And when all is said and done, sometimes these range, they can range all over the board. But let's use as a rule of thumb 30% or whatever. So 30% as a discount means that the value that you transfer, that 49% or $490,000, is 
is haircut by the 30%. So roughly the 70% remaining is $343,000. That's the amount, if you're giving it away, you report as a gift, right? How, why is this important? So instead of ex having to explain to the IRS that we're using $490,000 of our lifetime exemption, we're only using 343. So it efficiently uses whatever exemption we're utilizing. Valuation is very important. The bigger the value, the more important the valuation. In addition, um, the types of discounts uh, go beyond marketability and minority interest. So we have appraisers here at SVA, and, and these are the folks that we lean on in developing. This is the audit support material in case you're ever audited. And, and, and we actually defend these at audit and are very uh, good at what we do. So the fact that on, on, on certain times under these acts, they might be taken away, these, these strategies, it becomes, boy, we better get to doing it now, right? We better get to work before these, these strategies are taken away. And we're gonna talk more about how that's gonna happen, but let's talk about you know, the effective date on, 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 on this. And these would be for transfers after the date of enactment. Well, the date of enactment literally is the signing date. So it passes and then the president gets to sign it. Uh, typically that's the enactment date. So it may not be January 1 of 22. If the law is passed in October, if the law is passed in July and it's signed, um, that could be the effective date. So the time that we have available to perform these appraisals to make these uh, strategy transfers, to do gifting, to do estate planning and implement those strategies um, may not be as long of a lead time as we think, at least under the 99.5% Act. So there are two ways that the 99.5% Act is attacking the valuation rules. One uh, relates to the general valuation rules themselves. What it wants to do, what, what, what it purports to do is take out non-business assets. So think of passive, passive assets. Those assets that don't contribute to the active conduct of a trade or business, so marketable securities, triple net lease rental property, those types of assets, instead of being considered part of an entity and then the entity interest you're transferring being valued, this rule, this proposed rule would take these non-business assets out of the valuation picture and treat them as if they're gifted or transferred directly to the recipient. So I don't know how many of you are familiar, but we like to utilize what are called family limited partnerships or family LLCs, where we take uh, a post liquidity event, say a sale of a business. Now there's these liquid, liquid assets. We put them in a family limited partnership because it's hard if we didn't have the partnership to start transferring assets and, and take some type of discount, even though you've got a blockage discount available to you. But what we use is the structure and so it ends up being valued in the transfer, in the gift or the sale or the transfer at death is a piece, a piece. So we look at that 49% piece again, or something under 50%. And we think about those uh, discounts. And in fact, the marketability of the entity itself is called to question when we think about its, its valuation. Again, because of the lack of ability to look for liquidity or, or, or liquidation. And, and, and so, so those non-business type assets will be pulled out, called out, and, and not available for valuation discounting. In addition, the minority discount concept uh, speaks to that whole basis of control. Do I have control in what I'm transferring? And does the recipient, more importantly, have control? And if they don't, then there's some valuation discount ascribed to it. Well, what the proposed rules would do was look to see is if the transferee, the person who's receiving the interest would um, in fact, when aggregated with other family members who still have ownership in that entity, would there be a controlling interest amongst them all? So attribution is now brought up where it wasn't before. And if, if the attribution brings up control as an overriding concept, we wouldn't be able to apply the minority discount again. So we're stuck and, and we're in a rock between a rock and a hard place. And there are so many, so many people that we can do valuations for between now and whenever that date of enactment is.
More specifically, um, we get a little bit of relief uh, under the proposal from the non-business asset rule, where if we have inventory and accounts receivable, uh, look, that's working capital. Those won't be called non-business assets. Those will be allowed to be part of the business, the entity, when we look at the valuation. Real property, um, if we think about the 750 material, 750 hour material participation rule, that will be able to be thought of as a trade or business, not a passive asset that has to be valued as if it's being transferred directly. Um, all right, let's, let's look at a example or a chart, if you will, of how this attribution of family interest goes. So it is going to look at under this particular code section, and I'm not asking all of you to memorize the code section, but look at the chart. So here I am, I'm gonna to look to my siblings, my spouses, my descendants, my spouse's descendants. And if when I take all those into consideration, it adds up to a control of the entity that I'm transferring, nope, I don't get to use the minority discount. So not a good thing. Let's think about it in terms of numbers because I, as an accountant, more importantly, you from a pocketbook standpoint, let's say you die with this $10 million asset. Let's say it's already into the gross estate realm where you're thinking about paying, having to pay an estate tax and, and you'd already given some away, but you, you've you got and you've left with yourself uh, a minority um, share. So $10 million asset, Normally we'd have an appraiser on it. We'd get a marketability adjustment. We'd get a minority interest adjustment. That's a 32% discount right there. We're left with a value of $6.8 million. Even if the rate goes up from 40 to 45%, that tax is $3.06 million, all right? But if the proposals go through and we don't get the valuation discount because it's a family-owned business, you don't get the minority, it's um, maybe was made up of of, of non-business assets. We don't get the marketability adjustment. You got a $10 million asset, straight up $4.5 million tax. That's a 47% tax increase and a tax increase in total dollars of $1.44 you know, $4 million. So um, this is an important thing to look at. I took a few, or we took a few industry examples here. Um, people in the automotive, uh, automobile dealership business, that is a trader business. Apartment building, if you materially participate, uh, that business would be a trader business. Triple net lease, on the other hand, nope, not a trader business. Now, what if it's owned by family members altogether? You can see we're gonna start running into trouble. So in none of those instances would we use the minority discounting approach, only in the automotive, automobile dealership example and the material participation real estate example do we get the marketability discount. Um, so in the triple net lease scenario, as long as it's family owned and passive, we're not getting any discount. So bad scenario. E.G., let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the strategies that we like to use that could be pulled out from us. Okay. So first let's talk about grantor trusts. And grantor trusts are part of some potential planning techniques that one can use to take advantage of the current laws before they are changed. In simple terms, a grantor trust is a trust in which the grantor, the creator of the trust, retains one or more powers over the trust. And because of this, the trust income is taxable to the grantor. But when the grantor dies, the assets are not included in the grantor's estate. Now, when the grantor pays the income tax on the trust income, this is not a taxable gift that would use up a portion of the grantor's estate and gift tax exemption. So the payment of the trust income tax by the grantor reduces the grantor's estate and allows the value of the assets inside the trust to grow even more because they're not being reduced by income taxes. Now a grantor can sell assets to a grantor trust 
without realizing a taxable gain and, it, and can exchange personal assets with assets inside the trust also without realizing a taxable gain. So what are the proposed effective dates affecting grantor trusts? So for grantor trusts created after the date of enactment, when a grantor dies, the fair market value of the assets in the trust will now be included in the grantor's estate for estate tax purposes. And if prior to the grantor's death, distributions are made from the trust to the beneficiaries, these distributions would be taxable as gifts. Existing grantor trusts would be grandfathered under the existing rules, as long as you did not make any transfers into or sales to the trust after the date of enactment. This is why it may make sense to establish a grantor trust prior to the date of enactment. Let's switch our focus now to generation skipping trusts also known as GST, exempt trusts. So currently I can set up a trust that will stay in existence for multiple generations for the benefit of my children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, et cetera. In fact, the trust can stay in existence for perpetuity. You may have heard of such trusts referred to as generation skipping trusts or dynasty trusts. One of the benefits of this type of trust is that when my children die, for example, the assets in the trust are not included in their estate, even though during their lifetimes, they would have had access to the income or principal of the trust according to the terms of the trust. Thus, the trust assets are not reduced by any estate tax. This would be true for each subsequent generation. You can see how this would significantly impact the value of the assets in the trust not being reduced by estate taxes as each generation dies. Now the proposed change would only allow these types of trusts to avoid estate tax for 50 years. An existing trust would no longer be grandfathered like with grantor trust so they could only avoid a state tax for 50 years from the date of enactment. Now let's talk about GRATS or grantor retained annuity trusts. A GRAT is created when a grantor contributes assets with appreciation potential to an irrevocable trust for a number of years. The grantor then retains the right to receive an annuity over the term of the trust. The amount of the taxable gift is calculated by subtracting the value of the annuity from the fair market value of the property transferred into the trust after the appropriate discounts that Rick had previously talked about. The IRS assumes that the trust assets will generate a return of at least the applicable section 7520 rate of the Internal Revenue Code in effect for the month that the assets were transferred to the trust. So the May rate right now is 1.2%. So any appreciation of the assets in the trust in excess of this 1.2% rate passed to the trust beneficiaries free of gift tax. Now, and given the current low rates, it's easy for the appreciation to exceed the 1.2% rate. Also under current law, you can zero out the amount of the gift into a grant. And I've used this technique if I've had an individual who's used up all of their estate tax exemption we can still move assets out of their estate the future appreciation in them by making a zeroed out gift into a grant. So for transfers made after the date of enactment, the term of the grant now must be at least 10 years, but no longer than the life expectancy of the grantor plus 10 years. 
And also we can no longer zero out the amount of the gift because the remainder value inside the trust amount now must be equal to some minimal value. Now let's talk about annual exclusions. So today I can gift up to $15,000 a year to everyone on this call. And since I am married, my wife Barb and I could give each one of you $30,000, $15,000 from each of us. These gifts are called annual exclusion gifts and do not use up any portion of your estate and gift tax exemption. However, if you do not use it in a particular year, you lose it, you don't carry it over. So it's a use it or lose it um, exclusion. So since I have three children, two of whom are married and one grandchild, Barb and I can give away $180,000 a year, six times $30,000 by utilizing annual exclusion gifts. Now there are talks about reducing the amount of the annual exclusion to $10,000 per recipient or $20,000 per donor. So if that happens, the $180,000 a year that Barb and I could give away would be reduced to respectively either $120,000 or $40,000 a year. Also gifts in the trust would be capped at $30,000 per year before you would have to start using up your estate and gift tax exemption. This would may affect irrevocable life insurance trust where you are gifting cash into the trust each year in order for the trust to pay the annual premiums on the insurance policy owned by the trust. So if the premiums are more than $30,000 a year, you may look at making a large gift into the trust this year before the exemption goes down in order to fund future year premiums, or you may have to look at loaning money into the trust or else go back to what was uh, a favorable method in the past called split dollar life insurance. Now, Rick will now cover the rules on the income tax basis of inherited assets. Thanks, E.G. I think if we haven't called it out yet, um, one of the proposals also seeks to deunify the lifetime exemption, whereas I think we both pointed out $11.7 .7 million today is you can be given away during life or at death, but um, the deunification would have the gift tax exemption go down to $1 million and the estate tax exemption uh, go down to something higher than that, 5 million or 3.5 million. If that's the case, then uh, current transfers uh, could be under attack from a gifting standpoint, if not uh, at death. So one of the longest standing rules, as you would consider it, is the ability of an inheritor to step up the basis of an asset received as an inheritance to the date of death value, right? And so what does that mean? So if I have uh, a business and it's worth $10 million, but my basis in the business is uh, $8 million, if I leave it to my child and uh, my child gets a step up in basis in that uh, uh, stock to the $10 million date of death value, uh, he can then sell that business, not that I want them to, but they could sell the business and not pay any capital gains tax on the sale of the stock. Um, what's being proposed is that step up would no longer be available. So this sensible, sensible transact, tra excuse me, tongue tied, sensible taxation and equity promotion act, the step act, as I've called it already, um, is, is what we're talking about that was first on the scene to rebuke that uh, current law. Um, President uh, Biden uh, made part of those proposals of the step act, part of his American family plan. So we've got some similarity there. Uh, Senator Wyden has a uh, piece of legislation floating out there called the mark to market rule where he would only look to 
um, publicly traded stocks and bonds, if you will, and then only if the uh, person dying has income above a million dollars or assets greater than 10 million, and the, and the rest would not lose the step up in basis, would continue to be stepped up. Um, and then there's been some a thought about, well, is there just, should there just be a carryover basis similar to what we have with gift tax right now when the gift is made, it's, it, there's no step up at gift. So while these are the possibilities, the most uh, difficult to deal with is the uh, STEP Act, I, I, I believe. And, and, and because it's very similar to Biden's proposal, I think while we, while we didn't think it had much of a chance before, maybe it's starting to gain some steam. And another reason I think that is because in the whole scheme of things, it's changing the tax rate on estate taxes from 40 to 45% or 50% and we've had 50% before, is only a small chunk of the governmental budget. But when you think about all the people dying and whose estates would no longer be stepped up, and in fact, maybe perhaps in charging a toll tax and then compounding it with an increasing capital gain rate, maybe to 39.6, that's gonna be a bigger, bigger drop in the bucket for the governmental expenditures that are being uh, floated out there uh, to help support that. So I don't like it, but, maybe it's, uh, and it is something we need to be uh, considering. So uh, that's going to change a lot of our strategies. In, instead of having people die with assets and getting a step up, maybe we think about uh, transitioning them more equally now and or perhaps looking at smoothing out income now so that we never get above that million dollar income level to hit the 39.6 capital gain tax if that comes to be. One of the other uh, considerations um, we're starting to uh, talk more to clients about is uh, charitable remainder trusts, especially for those that are philanthropic. The ability to uh, use a charitable remainder trust and alleviate some of what could be the damage done by the STEP Act is important, uh, as well as what I talked about in smoothing income between now and later years to try and stay under the radar of those increase in tax rates. Let's, let's look at uh, some of the common goals we think about now as we're doing planning in this, I wanna say cutting edge, if you will, but some of the things that we're doing now to, to, to help clients as we look to perhaps a cliff, if not in 26, before then, if some of these proposals come to be, well, we're, we're talking about this um, retroactive change as an outside possibility. So what if I, do some wealth planning now and I give away $5 million or $8 million to use up some of my currently $11.7 million exemption, but they roll back the exemption to a million dollars retroactive to 1121. I just counsel the client to incur a gift tax. Well, again, we don't expect it to be retroactive, but if it were, there's some strategies that can be utilized that require elections later at the end of the year, within nine months after the end of the year, Think about a qualified terminable interest property election, which can be involved in a lifetime trust, not just in that marital type trust we more commonly think of it being utilized at, at death. Also a disclaimer type trust where the beneficiary could say, no, thanks for giving me those assets, but I really don't want them. You've got nine months after uh, the transfer to make that uh, qualified disclaimer. So that way we can uh, eliminate the negative uh, impact of a, a retroactive law change. A lot of clients remember 2012 and they thought, hey, we thought exemptions were gonna go back down to a million dollars then, it actually went up from whatever it was, three and a half million to $5 million. We see no th reason to think they'll go up, but we do think that they will go down. But there are also some strategies that we have that can um, provide additional access or control, if you will, so that there won't be that buyer's remorse like there was in January of 2013 after 2012. We also understand that, look, hey, it's not just about the estate tax itself. There are good reasons to utilize some of these structures, grantor retained annuity trusts, grantor trusts in general um, that involve asset protection. Future creditors, which include future ex-spouses, if you will, uh, the ability to asset protect 
uh, while doing estate planning is very important. And so these goals will and should be addressed if and when you do your estate planning, which we're recommending that you get to be doing now and not wait till these laws take hold. E.G. So let's talk about a state tax policy policy shift here. So with the current uncertainty as to what the provisions may be included in any new tax law and uncertainty as to the effective date of any new law, you should act now, but with caution to take advantage of the current higher estate and gift tax exemption before it's reduced. And also take advantage of valuation discounts and the use of grantor trusts. Also keep in mind, as Rick mentioned earlier, even if there isn't any law changes, a lot of these, um, like for example, the increased exemption gets cut in half after 2025. So now let's talk about some planning techniques that are available to take advantage of the current law before it is changed. You know, when thinking about what assets to give, keep in mind that if possible, you want to give the assets that you expect to appreciate the most in value to maximize the benefit of the exemption. And all the techniques that, you know, we're going to be talking about here today may not apply to you, even if they will save you estate taxes, because they may not meet your personal objectives or income needs which take precedence over any tax savings. Now, 2021 may be an opportune time to gift interests in closely held businesses if the value of the business has been depressed due to COVID-19. Also, interest rates are still currently low, but rising as set forth on the slide. And interest rates may impact the estate tax benefits of a number of planning techniques especially the one that Rick's gonna talk about on intentionally grantor trusts. Also, you can make loans to your children and charge the current low interest rates. Your children can then invest the loan proceeds in a new business venture or in marketable securities. And as long as the rate of return from the investment exceeds the interest rate, the family will come out ahead and you will have frozen uh, the value of your estate and moved the appreciation to your children. Now you could make outright gifts, but as Rick mentioned, this isn't gonna provide any asset protection from a divorcing spouse or creditor. So although it adds complexity, gifts into a trust are a better option as they provide more asset protection. One thing not mentioned on this slide are Roth conversions, where you move a portion of your money inside a traditional IRA and move it into a Roth IRA. The amount that you convert over into the Roth IRA, you pay income taxes on, but income taxes now may be as low as they're gonna be, and they're probably gonna go up. The payment of the income taxes reduces your estate uh, the amounts inside the Roth IRA grow tax-free for you and for your beneficiaries. It'll also reduce the amount of your required minimum distributions each year because you're not required to take distributions out of your Roth IRA, but your beneficiaries will. So think about a Roth IRA as a potential planning technique. As Rick mentioned before about flexibility, once again, since the effective date of any tax law changes are currently uncertain, when you implement any planning techniques, you wanna incorporate flexibility into the plan so that you can undo the plan in the event that the law does not change or the effective date is retroactive. And you can use, for example, disclaimers, which say that you know the trust could provide that the trustee could disclaim any gift within nine months, and then the gifted property would be returned to me as if the gift was ne never made. And there's other possible ways to add flexibility as shown on the uh, slide there. If 
Finally, let's talk about uh, SLATs or Spousal Lifetime Access Trusts. What if you wanted to use up your estate tax exemption before it's good, maybe reduced, but you're concerned about whether or not you would have enough income to maintain your current standard of living? Implementing a SLAT may meet your objectives. A SLAT is an irrevocable trust where one spouse transfers assets into the trust and the other spouse is a beneficiary of the trust. The transfer of the assets into the trust is a gift, which will use up a state tax exemption. And if the assets transferred are interest in a closely held business, the value of the gift can be reduced by appropriate discounts. The trust provisions could provide that distributions of income and or principal could be made to the beneficiary spouse should he or she need that to maintain her standard of living. Um, children or grandchildren could also be added to receive distributions. At the death of the grantor spouse and the beneficiary spouse, the assets in the trust would not be included in either of their estates. And after the death of the beneficiary spouse, the assets could stay in trust for the benefit of children, grandchildren, avoiding estate taxes at their death, be you know, generation skipping tax exempt trusts. And a SLAC can either be a grantor trust where the grantor pays the income tax on the trust income or a non-grantor trust where the trust would pay the income tax on the trust income. Major disadvantage of the SLAT is that the grantor spouse would lose access to the assets in the trust in the event of divorce or in the death of the beneficiary spouse. Although it may be possible for the beneficiary spouse also to set up a separate SLAT for the grantor trust, as long as the terms of the two SLATs are not identical. Now Rick's gonna talk about uh, the planning technique of sales to intentionally defective grantor trusts. Jennifer, in the interest of time, I'd like to use the next slide, 35, to discuss the, the three that deal with uh, IGITs. Um, EG's already talked about what a grantor trust is and how it works and the benefit of the grantor continuing to pay the tax and intentionally defective grantor trust simply is one where um, the trust is established, yet a certain rights are retained. And in, in doing so, it's called intentionally defective, meaning for legal purposes and for estate tax purposes, it exists just like a C corporation exists when you set up the stock for a C corporation. Um, but for income tax purposes, it's disregarded. And why is this important? It's disregarded similar to a single member LLC, let's say, because if I'm doing succession planning and I wanna get a value to the uh, next generation, and, uh, but I don't want to give it to them, I want them to pay for it. Well, how do they do that? What I can do is sell my interest or a portion of my interest to this trust I set up for them as beneficiaries. They can use the distributions from the uh, entity uh, as well as income if I put any other assets in it to uh, use those amounts to pay me back. Because initially the trust has nothing. I'm selling it on the, on the benefit that I'm gonna get paid back, but it's funded with, with nothing. But yet, Oftentimes we'll put seed money in there to make sure there's substance to the trust, yet that's not going to be able to pull the, pay the note in full. So the entity that the children are running has to continue to do well in order to see, receive distributions and, and income so that it can then pay the note back. Future appreciation, because everything beyond the sale price is going to escape my estate tax because I've sold it at a certain date early before it continued to skyrocket. Uh, um, and, and, and so this intentionally defective grantor trust option is an extreme um, benefit for those with, with businesses that are looking for succession planning. Um, the, the, the benefit that we have before us though could be uh, done away with under some of these proposals. So what should be your takeaways today? So our takeaways should be one, be proactive. Give your attorneys, give your appraisers, give your CPAs who are gonna crunch the numbers 
enough time to help you do the estate planning, to help you implement the estate plan. Um, be proactive. Some of these changes, we don't know uh, if they will be retroactive. We don't know when the actual effective date will be, if it will be before January of next year. But because we don't know, let's also build in some flexibility into our estate plan. Do it now, be flexible, and understand that, look, there are other things besides the state tax, the income tax, namely the capital gains tax that all factor in to how we do this planning. So there are some things that we need to consider as planners, as CPAs, when we're working with you and that we will work with you holistically to help you achieve the optimum or the least amount of tax overall. Um, EG always reminds me, Rick, hey, don't do this and uh, do different steps uh, right on top of each other. The IRS likes to utilize what's called a step transaction doctrine and would like to walk you through some of these, look through some of these steps. So try and leave some time in between. But what does that bring us back to? Right to point number one, start earlier so that you can provide some of that time in between some of the transactions. Thank you. All right, Rick and EG, great job. So much information. I guess main takeaways are a lot of different uh, potential outcomes legislatively, a lot of different tools uh, to, to address your estate planning. Rick, you just talked a little bit about timing. Talk to us a little bit about um, how long does this process take? I mean, I'm sure it's different for everybody, but, but understanding that this legislation can pop up and we don't know the exact timing, like how long does your typical estate planning process take? Well, normal course is literally six months because it just takes that long to get people together, to get people to understand their goals and objectives, to work with outside counsel, to get drafts uh, of documents done, to implement by funding the trust and in, in, in doing the things that are necessary from a beneficiary interest standpoint. So that said, uh, obviously we're going to be working as quicker, much more quickly than we can, than, 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 than what's oftentimes the case. So it's still going to be, you know, a couple months at minimum. And I'm sure the attorneys, have, and I see there are a couple on the phone are going to be screaming at me because they say it takes longer than that to work through stuff like this. And especially in complex situations, in fact, it does. So I guess I'm trying to hedge my bet and think we can do it quickly, but please, you know, you're, you're, there's only so much time. Right. And the last thing we want people to be in the situation of is, is, is uh, dealing with a musical chair situation where they're just trying to find people to get this done before a, a deadline coming up. Um, so I know we've already had a couple of very specific questions come through, just keeping in mind the wide range of, of uh, things discussed and how uh, uh, everybody's situation is different. I'd be a little bit more interested in taking maybe one or two questions that are a little bit broader. So if anybody has some uh, other broad questions to come in, I think there was one that came in about halfway through uh, when you were showing that um, table about the marketability discount and kind of which businesses and which industries are eligible. Where would people find information on other industries? So it's it's not necessarily industry specific, it's really fact specific. So if an industry leads, it, leads itself to a fact pattern, such as if we're worried about the control, that can be in any industry. If a family has control, a family has control. If I try and give away 10% and, and get a minority discount, I could be in any industry, it's gonna be a problem. If I worry about the marketability discount, industries that typically would be deemed passive type Activities normally like real estate, that's that's one you're not gonna win. So the passive loss rules, I mean, you could look to section 479 and some of those regulations, but I think again, it's not so industry specific as it is a uh, fact specific. And if we can build a case as we often do for passive act activities to make them active, um, we'll try and do that. Okay, we did have a, a question come in. Um, I think it would be, good for people to understand, how does SVA work with the attorneys to get estate plans developed? EG? Well, it, it's a team approach and it's just not the attorney, it's the, the wealth manager, it's the insurance advisor, especially given the short time period in which we have to work with, everybody has to be on the same page. 
So it works best if everyone is involved. Now with the CPA, we, we have all the financial information for the most part, so we can coordinate that with the other, with the other professionals. But I strongly recommend that it be a team approach and that's gonna be the most effective, effective and efficient way to get this done. Great, thank you. So knowing that we're already at uh, one o'clock, um, as we wrap up, I just wanna let you know, you can visit svaaccountants.com slash hub where the recording of this webinar will be located as well as the slide deck and a whole bunch of other information, including recordings of, of past webinars. I know there were several other questions that came through that were much more specific, but just keep in mind the SVA team is only a phone call or an email away. So if you're a client, uh, reach out to your SVA contact. Um, and if you're not a client, reach out to me and I can get you answers to any questions that you may have or get you connected to uh, any resources that you need. So thank you again for joining us today. A lot of information, a lot to soak in. Uh, we hope you have a great rest of your afternoon and we hope to see you at, uh, at any of our future webinars. Thanks very much. Thank you.